Welcome to the weekly quest. I think we are at number five or six, maybe five. You guys know? Six. Yeah, six. Okay, fantastic. I'll see. We are already six weeks of uh, weekly quest. You know, it was going very fast. Uh, I hope you had a very good week. We did. And uh, we're going to talk to you about the latest news, some of them which might be quite fun or surprising. At least for me, it was uh, very surprising. But in any way, we're going to get talk about that in a minute. First of all, please, uh, if you would, if you could uh, subscribe, share, and like our videos, that would be a great help for us. And with all that said, I found something very surprising, and I would say a bold move, but actually quite interesting. Uh, if you were like me, I don't know for you guys, you will tell me your experience, but uh, back when I was a kid, if you were uh, playing games uh, and watching manga, anime, like Dragon Ball, something like this, it was not something you were talking about at school, right? It was not something to be proud of. Uh, you weren't going to make many friends like this. And uh, how far have we gone? <laughs> because right now, politicians are actually using video games to get your votes. And I was extremely surprised, but it makes sense. Apparently, and that doesn't surprise me, uh, young people are among the people who vote the least. Uh, not very interesting politics, and I won't blame them. And one of the ways that... Uh, oh, God, what's the name of the guys? The Harris and Vols campaign uh, made a map on Fortnite. So not this guy, of course, that team. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, I don't suppose that she's very good at Fortnite. But... Um, Yes, they created a map called the uh, Freedom Town, which kind of looks like Manhattan with a big uh, Statue of the Liberty, to push young people to vote. You know, like it's it's uh, a political campaign as a Fortnite map on a creative mode. So I'm going give to you, give you a, mo uh, a code. It's not really interesting, sorry, but for a second. If you want to access this stage, it's on the creative map code 7331. Five five three six six five four seven. It's a pretty a pretty large um, map based on exploration. Not to be on Fortnite for me. It was merely uh, you know like shooting at each other. So shooting at each other in Manhattan. That's more like GTA six in my book. Well, GTA five sorry in my book, but could be interesting. But it is but with big you know like electoral slogan all over. <laughs> Say go vote. So that's that's. I mean, that kind of fun. What are you guys thinking about? Um, do you think this is an interesting way to reach new voters? Is it? Does it mean that video games world has gone so big that now even politicians just can't ignore us? That's kind of the feeling they have now. Yeah, you're, you're a gamer. We want your vote. I don't think it's going to change too many people's votes. I think if you've already decided who you're voting for, I don't think your Fortnite map's going to convince you to go the other way. Um, nor do I think it's going to turn anybody away. I think this is more of, uh, I mean, it says go vote, but I think this is probably more geared at younger audiences and trying to get, um, you know, younger people on your side so that when they are old enough to vote, you know, kind of try to appeal to them early, you know, so that way they get a good impression of you. And I don't think this is so much for people in their, you know, maybe mid, late 20, maybe some people in their younger 20s, uh, maybe late 20s, but I think people by their 30s or so, I don't think this is going to make any difference. So I think this is really for, say, people in their teens who are going to be voting soon, probably not in this election, but, you know, in elections in the future and trying to get them on board with uh, the party and, and trying to get them to to think of them favorably. So, I mean, you know, you do what you can uh, to to win votes. So I think it's a gamble. I don't think it's a, I think it's a very safe gamble. Um, you know, in the sense that you could get people really on board. It could also go the other way where you get memed to hell, um, which is definitely a possibility in today's world. But, uh, I think it's probably, probably safer than it is, uh, a risk. So it's, it's clever. I'll give them that. And uh, like, uh, Craig was telling me before the show. Yeah, actually the, uh. So the guy who was running with uh, with Harris, can't remember his name, sorry, but uh, he was doing uh, he was using the Twitch platform, so like we are doing to play Madden. Maiden, or is it uh, football? Madden, right? Football so, game. so American American football to play and chat with potential voters on a Twitch channel. So 
clearly our world is invading politics. It's a pride, but what do you think, Korean? Right, right. No, I mean, I mean, this, this is right? not new. Uh, like AOC um, has been on Twitch for, I mean, since she got into Congress and she has, I just looked it up. I was like, oh, um, she has 928,000 followers on Twitch, right? Um, and she's been someone who's sort of engaged with Twitch. I would say probably the most iconic American politician, the largest follower on Twitch. I could be wrong there. Um, but again, it's it's just, it's such a nice conversation because I've seen people who, again, these are all like people like me, liberal left-leaning people who are like, yeah, you know, I was on Twitch. I was talking to her. I was like, what do you think about tax breaks with little class? And while she's playing video games, she will answer questions. And I mean, I think that's, it reminds me of the old sort of like Twitter. And I remember I asked a journalist who did an autobiography about Hayward Clinton. And I, I said to her, I'm like, hey, I saw this in the book. Like, what do you think? And, and she replied. And I think that's the, the beauty of live platforms, right? It's like even somebody watching Adam, like, hey, Adam, I'm thinking of moving to Taiwan. And Adam will give them advice because he's live on the air and at least not going to hold back, right? Um, I, I mean, this is the, the beauty of playing games, right? It, it's then accessible. It is non-confrontational. It's not like going to a town hall or do, even doing a virtual town hall, right? Where it's like, hey, oh, you're on stage with Tim Walls, and now you've you've got a thousand, a hundred thousand people listening to you, right? It's you're playing a game, and you get to ask a question in chat, or if you're playing with the person, right? You get to ask a question, and it's less stressful. Um, I think it's it, it's an amazing experience, and it's definitely not a. a from what I know, globally speaking, um, no one else on the on the right wing conservative woman has does this kind of stuff again. It tend to appeal to older people, so it's. I think it's it's wonderful. Like Adam said, I totally agree. It's not going to change anybody's mind. Um, I think it is going to sway somebody to say like, "Hey, um, I'm a conservative Fortnite player, and look at this person who's here. Hmm, maybe I should think about this." Right? I think it's it's. If I had to throw a number, be like at twenty percent, like, hmm, these people are playing something I enjoy, or they're partaking in something that I enjoy. Maybe I should consider their point of view. But it's not going to be like, oh my god, I just saw Kamal Harris and Tim Walls in Fortnite, or um, they were on Twitch, or they were on YouTube Live, and I'm going to magically switch my mindset and vote liberal or Democrat, right? Or what? I mean, the equivalent in your country. Um, as much as I wish that would happen, it's not. Can't wait the future of uh, you know French presidency being played on football manager twenty five. <laughs> that'd be that's not gonna happen, but that'd be great. And uh, with this, the uh, we are not talking about politics <laughs> on this channel. Window is finished, so thank you very much. Leave us your comments on you know whatever you think of our video game world, which is getting bigger and bigger, or at least you know serve as a bigger tool for political needs. And uh, after that, then now we can talk about Monster Hunter Wild with Adam. So, uh, if you are a Monster Hunter fan and you've been wanting to play Monster Hunter Wild, you're going to have to wait a bit, well, for the actual game. The demo is actually coming out very soon. It will be coming out on November 1st, and it will be running, running from and... November 1st to the 4th. It is going to be covering the introduction to the game and two hunts. One of those hunts is going to be the introduction and the tutorial. The other one is going to be an actual hunt that you can participate on. But if you are on PS Plus, you can start playing the demo as, or not the demo, sorry. You can start playing the beta as of one hour ago. So you can play it right now, which means that uh, don't stop watching us if you are watching us live because you are going to have to download it. Start downloading it now, and then when the show's over, you can go ahead and play, uh, which is what I plan on doing because I downloaded free downloaded it yesterday. Um, but yeah, the hunts are going to be... I'm going to probably mispronounce these uh, monsters incorrectly because I haven't played Monster Hunter since the original one. But uh, on the introduction is the Katakabra hunt. And that's one that's going to have the tutorial in it. And then there's also going to be the, the Shug, Dashaguma, Dashaguma hunt. So those are going to be available. The purpose of the beta is to allow players to experience a limited portion of the game, but also, of course, to verify things like network load and that sort of thing. So you are going to be able to send up SOS flares to get either other people to join your hunts, or if you can't get other people, then you can bring NPCs into your hunts with you. 
So you can be able to do that. You don't have to face these things alone. Even if you don't have a friend, you can just get the, an AI to be your friend, which is a, a sad, sad commentary on the future of our potential social relationships. Um, but yeah, at least you can play, right? And also it's going to be offering full character, cre uh, for full character creation and Palico customization. Uh, so that's going to be available. Also, you are going to be able to recreate your character as much as you want throughout the entire demo. So if in the last two games, Monster Hunter Rise and Monster Hunter World, uh, if you wanted to change your character in the game, you had to buy a, what they called a, was it a character, uh, character edit voucher. And so the character edit vouchers, you would get one free one. And then after that, you could then buy other ones. Now, obviously there were people that would mod the game so that you could get unlimited of these. Uh, which I'm not going to mention those mods because I think people should be able to edit their character whenever they want. And I don't want those people who made those mods getting in trouble. I don't want Capcom taking those down. So I'm not going to mention which ones, but you can do your own research on that. But you, if you're on PC, you could get unlimited edits. But if you're on console, you can't. Now with the uh, with the beta, you will have unlimited respecking. I don't know if that'll be in the final game. The fact that they pointed it out as being available in the beta uh, makes it sound like it won't be available in the main game, but hopefully they'll change their mind because they do say on the website that uh, this is not the final product and they may be making changes depending on how things go in the beta. So, uh, but yeah, and if, again, like I said, the PS Plus starts October 28th, which is today, goes to October 31st, and then it is available for everybody on November 1st to November 4th. Uh, if you are playing the PS Plus version of the beta, then you can just carry over your data from that beta to the second beta, which will then carry over to the main game. So you will have a total of what? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. You'll have about seven or eight. You'll have about a week to play this game as much as you want uh, with those two fights. I don't know what weapons will be available. I don't know if all of them will be available or not. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, and I'm going to check the terms of and service terms of service on this. Uh, I would think being an open beta, it should be okay to stream, uh, but still better safe than sorry. So I'll check the terms of service when I down when I do finally play it later today. And then, uh, yeah, if uh, it's okay to stream, then I'll probably be streaming that because I finished Dead Space last week. And uh, yeah, now I have no games to play on Wednesday and Friday. So this makes perfect oh, yeah. sense. No games for Halloween. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could do Project Zomboid. I still have that one. So yeah, that is still in the scene, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I agree. If it's an open beta, it should be safe. To stream. Should be fine. I've been a few closed Otherwise. betas, and they definitely say mm -hmm. you cannot stream this. <laughs> so I have a question for you guys: fun. Like, do people in our age group still play demos and and like short access games like this? Because I was like thinking, like, even I bought. <clears throat> Frostpunk 2. I'm like, I realize I'm never going to play Frostpunk 2. It's it's terrible. I mean, just because there's just no time to play it. It's just play Coral Island, finish Echoes of Wisdom. Ah, 2025, gone. And, and I mean, this just like, I mean, why would anyone over, I mean, why would people in our age group play a demo? I mean, do people play demos? I guess you guys tell me, what do you think? I still play demos. I played the demo for Stellar Blade. I played the demo for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I played the uh, character creation. It wasn't really a demo, but for Dragon's Dogma. And I'm going to be playing the demo for Monster Hunter World. So, I mean, at least I do. Um, especially with something like this being an open beta and it being such a big game. I do think people will do it because it's like, even if you are the kind of person who plays one game at a time, these are only available for a week. So you're like, okay, I'll just play it for a week. And then I just hop right back into the game I was playing. So, you know, and then there's definitely that FOMO, you know, in there of like, oh, if I don't play it now, I can't play it next week because it won't be available. I have to play it this week. So I think that's part of it, too. So I, I think I think demos are still viable. And uh, I would actually recommend it because you can <laughs> a demo is usually either free or very cheap as an early access. And you know that I'm going to do the early access of Subnautica, even though it's it's going to be completely different from the finally released game. But if it's something like Monster Hunter that, let's say, I haven't, I have never played a Monster Hunter until World, right? 
And I would have, uh, if I could, I should have played the demo first to see what uh, hype is all about because it's a very specific gameplay to a very specific game. You either love it or hate it, really. And uh, the demo is really good for you to say, okay, I played two hours of this game. I love the, the gameplay, whatever it's going to be. So yes, I know I'm going to wishlist this game and buy it at, uh, at lunch. If you don't like it, when well, you just saved $80 on a game you're not going to play. Yeah, that actually uh, happened to me recently because Rise of Ronin was a game I'd kind of been watching for a while. And I was like, oh, yeah, maybe I want to play Rise of Ronin. I liked uh, Neo too. So, you know, maybe this will be a similar game that I'll enjoy. You know, I like Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, so why not? And I tried the demo and uh, yeah, I, I, it didn't click with me. So I was kind of like, oh, OK, maybe I'll just give this one a skip. All right, so. then to summarize then for both of you guys, you you make time to play a demo because you don't love the thing you're playing now. Oh, oh, you can stop the thing you're playing no, now make a... and then go to the demo and come back to the thing you're currently playing? Yeah, a demo, I just do a demo is like a, you know, it's the same thing as watching a trailer, but it's a playable trailer for me. It's like, okay, you know, why do you watch videos on YouTube? Well, it's because you look at the game and you're like, okay, uh, do I want to play this game? Let me check out a video. Okay, that looks interesting. Or, oh, that doesn't look interesting. Same reason, you know, a lot of people go on Twitch. And a demo for me is just that. It's like, okay, well... I'm limited to two hours, you know, so, you know, if I play a demo today, I can go back to the game. You know, if I'm playing, you know, Final Fantasy, whatever, and it's Wednesday, I can play the demo tomorrow on Thursday. And then on Friday, I'll be back to Final Fantasy again. You know, not playing this other game that I'm playing for one day. It's not a huge time sink and it'll give me a good idea whether I want to buy a game or not. I see it as an investment because when you buy a game, especially $80, you want to try to finish it, even if you don't completely 100% it, right? And it could be as much as 40, 50, 100 hours, even more, depending on the game. Play the demo first, and you will see if you're going to enjoy these 50 hours or not. And you can save yourself 50 hours to play something that you're going to actually enjoy. So I don't think it's time lost. On the contrary, it's time saved. For me, I just I just don't get... I've been thinking about this recently. It's like... Um, even with early access, right? Like, if you're playing something you love right now, why would you stop playing it just to play a demo? And, and that's the thing that I wouldn't, maybe I'm just, I won't do that anymore. It's like, if I'm going to play something, I'll play it and play and play it, regardless if the perfect game came out, right? It's, it's as a demo or as early access, I just, I can't see myself stopping playing something I enjoy to try to take a roll of dice and play something that I might enjoy or might not enjoy. With you there. I wouldn't stop, uh, if I'm invested on a game, I wouldn't stop it just to play a demo. Demo is really just like, these days I'm playing 40 minutes of Helldivers here and there just because I don't have time. That's a good time to try a demo. If you're in the middle of Persona 3, 150 hours, but I wouldn't you would stop, stop right, to play you're like in the middle of something. Yeah. Okay. To me, it would be like, if you're watching, if you're binging a series on Netflix or something like that, right? And you know how like at the end of a Netflix episode, they or you know how like sometimes uh, they'll do like ads for other shows. I guess usually now they do it uh, at the end of um, when you finish a series or whatever. But imagine like if, if at the end of each episode, they, they showed you like, you know, a, a, a 10 minute or no, sorry, not 10 minute, like a, a 20 second trailer for another show. Right. And you see another show and you're like, oh, OK, uh, that looks interesting. You know, let me just pause what I'm watching right now, watch a, a, a short YouTube video on it, you know, five minutes, and then decide, well, do I want to add this show to my watch list and then watch it once I'm done with this show? You know, because if I if I'm like on episode 10 of, you know, 80 and I see a, a I see a trailer for another thing that looks interesting, by the time I get to episode 80, I'll probably forget what that is. So what I'll do is, you know, you might stop watch a little five minute video, uh, you know, like a YouTube clip or something. Is this the kind of, you know, a review of the show or whatever, and then be, okay, do I add this to my watch list? I do add it to my watch list and then go back to what I'm watching. Um, so for me, it's just that, you know, I'm playing, uh, playing a regular game and I'm like, oh, okay, this other game looks interesting. Do I want to add it to my wish list? Okay. Well, let me try the demo. I mean, if it's a demo that's available all the time, I'll wait till I'm done. Right. 
Like if I'm playing Persona, I'll finish Persona, then I'll play the demo, then I might play the next game. I did the same thing with Rise of Ronin demo. I played it between two games. Uh, but something like this, where it's a limited time, it's like, okay, well, you know, I can't do that later, so I might as well just do it now and then go back to the, you know, this, I won't be able to play this next week, so I'll just go back to what I was regularly playing. Cool. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, that was a great topic, actually. And that's the topic I chose first because uh, Korean's uh, first story, it's on a game that's going to have a lot of trouble pronouncing. I think we're going to talk about Merce. Actually, I want to jump to my, my second story first, um, just just for the sake of time. Let's talk story first. So if you guys right. follow us on threads, you would see I posted something with a picture of the Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, and how he got a $30 million raise. And then so this story this week as well. Um, got a thirty million dollar raise after um, they laid off so far year to date two thousand five hundred fifty employees, something along that line, right? And that's terrible, right? You got a thirty million dollar raise, and someone had read, did the math. So for his raise, I think basically for each person fired, it was twenty eight thousand dollars roughly, right? And that came up to his thirty million dollar raise, which is again. Lots of you argued with me on this about threads, you know, like Microsoft's, you know, also in the trillion dollar market cap company range these days. They totally deserve it. But again, if you listen to my rants about many things, you know, I'm definitely more on the left wing side of things. I don't think CEOs should be making crazy money like that. Um, I posted something on threads yesterday, which shows that the uh, average CEO in the U.S. now earns more than 290 times the typical worker, right? Which is ridiculous, right? Um, no person does 290 times more work than the other person. That's more than two people or three people, whatever. It's no, 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 no. Rich people, you don't deserve that money. I'll say that right now. Um, that's tiny rant being said. Let's go over the gaming's top earners. Um, as of 2023, now in, in certain cases in 2024, this might have changed. Like the number one on our list is Bobby Kodik. And of course, you know, Blizzard Activision doesn't technically exist anymore. Um, but as of 2023, uh, his base salary was 875000 uh, and total compensation $375 million for the year of 2023. Um, and I think that, that number is inflated because um, that includes his exit package. So if you're not familiar with uh, finance or business or that sort of stuff is when someone leaves a company or they're pushed out or whatever the reason may be, right? They usually get like a bonus, like the, the former CEO of Starbucks got um, $37 million uh, this year for leaving Starbucks. Um, and then loads of CEOs, they get like multi-million dollar packages to say, hey, um, even if you're good or bad, you get multi-million dollars to leave the company and probably sign a few NDAs to say, hey, I won't talk about what I did or I didn't do. Um, so Bobby Kodik, number one. Uh, number two was Robert Enterco Plitika. Um, Anton and I were talking about this before uh, the show started. They were like, what the hell is Plitika? Plitika has to do with the World Series of Poker. Um, and he had a total compensation of $48 million, but a base salary of 17000 and people were like, base salary, 17000 Oh, that guy's so nice. No, he's not. He's still another rich person. Loads of people have like salaries of zero. Plus, they get stock options and bonus options and performance options and that sort of stuff. So um, the next number three is the CEO of Tink2, which is Strauss Zelnick, which is a name I've never heard. Um, base salary of 250000 total compensation of $42 million. And I guess that's what you get when you turn GTA Five into this... Uh, microtransaction full game with lots of role playing and other things and people buy shark cards or I thought was the coolest and the worst name at the same time for cash in GTA 5. Uh, number four is John Ricitelio, ex Unity CEO, uh, 27 million. Number five, Andrew Paradise Skills. I have no idea what this company is. I'm going to skip that. Oh, it's uh, online gambling. Uh, number six, Andrew Wilson, EA CEO, with a total compensation of $25 million. Uh, number seven, Zynga. Number eight, Min Liang Tan. Oh, Tan Min Liang would be the right way. The CEO of Razer. Um, 
It's nice to see representation on here with a total compensation of 10 million. Uh, Kim Peijing, Kek Jin, uh, the CEO of NCSoft, which I didn't realize NCSoft was that big, uh, total compensation 7 million. And the cool thing at the bottom over here is they mentioned the CEO of FromSoft, Hidetaka Miyazaki, um, and they don't mention a specific number, but they do mention like Nintendo and uh, FromSoft having much lower salaries because they care about the companies and the employees. And um, which again, you know, when all these layoffs started happening two years ago, right? Like um, I remember Taiwanese friends asking me like, why are these people getting laid off, laid off right? Like uh, layoffs tend to not happen in Asia. Companies save a lot of money. Um, it, it's also, there's a, a, a big system of loyalty and I know some of you may be thinking, oh my God, Asian work sounds amazing and stuff. But again, you come with lower salaries, um, much lower salaries. Though in some companies that is made up in the sense of you might get a six to nine month bonus um, all at one time come Chinese New Year next year. You might get, and in some very big companies, you get two years or three years of your salary, but those are usually the semiconductor companies. Um, so yeah, it's, I think for me, the conclusion is basically uh, gaming CEOs have not escaped the other CEO salary compensation line where it's like they earn too much money for doing too little. Um, they oversee a lot. For sure, um, they always see a general vision of where we're going to take take two or where we're going to take EA. Um, and in some cases, I would argue it's the wrong direction. And I'm very much in the camp of saying you don't need to earn more than two to three million dollars per year as a person, right? What do you do with that extra money? You're sending your kids to boarding school in Switzerland. They don't need to go there. Um, but that's my take. I'll let the guys talk about whatever they want to talk about when it comes to salaries and CEOs. Yeah, no, the the Asian work is is not uh, ideal. The, the part of the reason that people don't get laid off is because of the laws. Uh, that's one thing that Japan is pretty known for. Is that uh, and part of the reason why they didn't have the layoffs that uh, the West did is because their laws prevented the companies from laying off people. Uh, unless, yeah, I think the law is basically you have to prove that the employee is problematic and that they are actually uh deserving of being laid off you can't lay them off because the company doesn't have the money to support them you have to prove that they are actually detrimental to the company uh and because of that it makes it much harder to do layoffs when you're just like oh okay well we're trying to cut costs because you can't do that um so that's part of the reason why people don't get laid off as much here uh but uh like even yesterday I was uh, teaching a class. It's a corporate class. Uh, they're a semiconductor company. It's not TSMC. It's a much smaller company. But uh, they were saying, you know, on average, they come in 8 a.m. and they don't leave the office until 9 p.m. So, you know, they're working 12 hours a day and they're actually in the, they're in the office 13 hours a day, uh, six, five days a week. And they're not even the worst. I had a, I, I, I worked with an accounting firm once and they were like, yeah, there are days where, uh, you know, we'll finish the day and we have four hours before we have to start work again. So we don't even go home for a week, you know, like we will, I'll go home one day a week and the rest of the days I'll just sleep at the office because there's just not enough time. Um, so yeah, not an ideal situation, uh, just because they don't get laid off. There are other, uh, downsides to it. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I I see both sides of the argument. I mean, obviously, do you need to be making that much money over somebody else? No, but at the same time, I think there is an argument to be made similar to sports stars where it's like, okay, what, you know, maybe you're not doing all the work, but you are adding value, uh, you know, by being there and uh, your experience and what you've done. Kind of like, uh, you know, if you have a soccer player who's just, really, really good. I mean, they're not carrying the team. They still have other players on the team who are working just as hard, uh, but that person, because they have name brand recognition and that sort of thing, they bring value to the team. Um, so, you know, does it have to be 290 times what your average worker is making? No, but, uh, but I, I, I can see certain arguments for it, but uh, yeah, I wish I had that much money. 
I wish I was making that much because I'm not making nearly that much. So, what do you think, Antoine? To be honest, it's hard to think. The numbers is so big. It's like winning the lottery every year is not even close to what they're earning. So, it's another world. Clearly, that's too much. Of course, it's too much. I, I have no clue what their day is like, what their responsibility is like. I'm not even sure it's something that I en I envy because, you know, like it's, uh, you know, you talk about sports team, I'm thinking about rock stars. They're earning a lot, but you really want to live their life. It's, you don't have a life. You, you sell your life and do you really enjoy the money you make? I'm not entirely sure of that because... You're working 24-7, seven, seven days a week when you see you, right? You don't have really, you don't really have time for, for family or things like So I can't say I envy that. Uh, yes, it's disproportionate. And uh, clearly, uh, I'm not doing, I say the Asian model is uh, perfect either because the black company type of work, like you just said, is absolutely insane. Work-life balance is essential. I just feel that with this kind of videos, we're going to have so many comments. <laughs> it's good. It's great. So, yeah, just uh, I'm on the fence in this one. So please tell us what you think, because that's uh, it's going to be an interesting topic to go over. And uh, with this, let's go to another story, which is it controversial? Not so much, but I know that uh, I'm going to talk about NVIDIA. I know that NVIDIA and M uh, AMD are, you know, like good old friends. Uh, but maybe uh, you would know or not, but NVIDIA is doing very, very, very well for a while. And it does, and they've been uh, fighting with Apple uh, for a while over who is the most valuable company. And as of October 25th, uh, maybe it's not the case uh, three days later, I don't know. But as of October 25th, they were the world's most valuable company with a market value of 3.53 trillion money, a uh, trillion dollars, trillion money. I mean, the same. So this is the kind of numbers that it's difficult to uh, comprehend, of course. But yes, yeah, so, you know, we are the company, a gamers company, clearly, who is at the top of the world. And you can wonder, is it uh, really, uh, how come NVIDIA is? you know, so valuable. Well, you know, cryptocurrency might have helped, you know, like uh, Queen can tell you, but when you have some very nice uh, GPU card series, you can uh, mine quite a lot, you know, mining farm has helped. They made some very good investment in AI uh, with uh, the automotive industry. And now AI, you know, is a big talk of every company in the world and NVI is at the forefront of this. So a very, very good investment under I'm actually surprised that the uh, NVIDIA CEO is not in your list, to be fairly honest with you. Because clearly, you know, if the CEO is a captain steering the ship, this captain has done a good work, right? And uh, on top of all of this, uh, 2025, I don't have the date, January, actually, they're going to announce, it's crazy at the reasons I'm going to, the RTX 5000 series. I I'm just... I'm just, you know, coming down the fact that uh, we are on the uh, 40, what, 4060, 4070 Ti or S or whatever. And we're already on the 5000 series in January. They, there is no stopping NVIDIA these days. So, yeah, they, uh, they are at least as uh, valuable as uh, Apple. Sometimes more, sometimes less. But yes, gaming industry represent the world these days. <laughs> So yes, it's a very, uh, very much a business conversation, business and political show today, which is curious, but you know, that happens. <laughs> it's because we're close to Halloween, so we want to scare you. <laughs> so what do you, what do you guys think of NVIDIA? Are you, do you wish that you would have invested in NVIDIA 10 years ago? Of course. Because <laughs> NVIDIA is 25 years old. With, I think, I have it somewhere, but... Uh, in 1999, <clears throat> we had the RTX uh, 236, 256, the NVIDIA Ge GeForce, GeForce, of course, not RTX, the GeForce 256, which put them on the map in 1999. You don't feel old now, right? I was talking about something really big. I was really old. Not, not, not that particularly, but, you know. <laughs> 
So, any idea yeah, no, of I mean, any comments about is, NVIDIA? I remember, I think when I started biking again after like 20 years, I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about um, NVIDIA's financials were not good. This would have been like five or six years ago. And the reason why is that they were investing in AI and data centers and that sort of stuff. Um, and they, uh, the news, I think, sort of like last week or two weeks ago was that uh, they they released a, a new AI chip, which is like the H100 or something like that, right? And this is the the, the chip that uh, X bought a bunch of to make their Grok AI. Um, and uh, there was a problem with the chip. And the, the, the story was that TSMC and Taiwan helped NVIDIA fix it. Um, and people were, and originally people were like, oh my God, TSMC screwed up. This is why this chip had a problem. But you know, I mean, NVIDIA was, is always going to be ahead of the game. Um, in, in, in some ways good, in some ways bad. Like NVIDIA is so ahead in terms of the GPU market. Um, earlier this year, AMD basically said, yeah, we're not doing high-end GPUs. So um, I mentioned this on the show, I believe it's, it's like Adam and my GPU is the last in the line of the GPUs that AMD are going to make. Um, because from whatever the 8,000 series or the 9,000 series is going to be, it's only going to be mid and low range AMD cards, um, just because it's not worth it. Apparently, on the I mean, not apparently, like realistically, it's not worth it for them to put in all this money and resources into making um, GPUs. Because I think AMD still controls or only controls 2.5 percent of the market in terms of GPUs, which is terrible. So I'm not happy about NVIDIA's GPU news. Um, don't get me wrong, the GPUs are great. Um, but I think it's bad that we have NVIDIA controlling 90, no, no, not 90, but it's uh, like, yeah, is it was at 90% of the market pretty much. Um, so I think they, someone on, needs to go after later. them and break them up like the DOJ is doing with Google. Good luck with that. Good luck. And with this little business news, let's go back to Adam with a story on the game we never talk about, Final no. Fantasy. No, we never talk about Final Fantasy. <laughs> Um, what we do talk about quite often, though, is Magic the Gathering. We have talked about this game nonstop since the beginning of the show. Um, I've actually never played Magic the Gathering. Have you guys ever played? Okay, Antoine's played. Has Korean played? Okay, I've oh, never played. Yeah, um, yeah growing up, uh, I, I knew people that played, uh, but we had a lot of those satanic panic kind of moms that were like, Magic the Gathering is Satanism. Um, and so <laughs> most of us didn't really play. Uh, we played other games. We played other card games. We played Pokemon. We played, uh, there was like a, some Star Wars uh, card games that we played. Apparently, Final Fantasy even has its own trading card game. Uh, so if you want to, you can hop into that. They actually, on their website, on the Square Enix website, they have a tutorial teaches you how to play and everything. Um, seems pretty simple. So I have no clue how to play Magic the Gathering. But uh, they do have, they've been doing several collaborations with various video games and game franchises. Uh, they've already done one with Street Fighter, Fortnite, Fallout, and 40K. And apparently later on this, or I guess later on next year, 2025, they're supposed to be doing one with Assassin's Creed. So uh, they are getting a lot of these kind of themed packs uh, with the uh, collabs with other people. So uh, anyway, the this is going to be featuring all sorts of characters, weapons, monsters, summons, and locations from the various Final Fantasy games. Uh, the characters that we've seen are Lightning, Sephiroth, and Kefka, and Emmett Selk, but they also mentioned that Terra, Noctis, and Cloud will be included. Uh, we know that they're going to be Chocobos and Behemoths. We've seen the uh, the male Moogle from Final Fantasy XIV. I have no idea what his card's going to be, but I'd be kind of curious. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I said, they said weapons. So I'm assuming things like buster swords and, uh, gun blades and all that sort of thing and locations. So apparently on the, uh, what do you call it on the trailer? I guess they would call it, or the kind of the announcement. They said that this is going to be the largest collection of Final Fantasy artwork ever in a single game, which seems odd. Cause I went and I was like, okay, but Final Fantasy has its own card game. So is this going to have more cards in magic than it has its own card game? So I went to their website and I looked. It looks like they have 3,308 cards for the Final Fantasy card game. So uh, I'm not sure how Magic's going to have more art <laughs> than any other game. Um, but maybe they just mean more art than any other non-official Final Fantasy game. Maybe they mean like the largest uh, art in terms of a collab. That might be a possibility. So, uh, but yeah. 
And uh, this brings up, oh, uh, sorry, this will be available on June 13th, 2025. So you can go out and you can check out, uh, try to get your cards there. I'm sure a lot of people who've never played Magic before are just going to be grabbing these for the collector collectability of them. Uh, but it has brought up some old allegations of Wizards of the Coast. Is it Wizards of the Coast? That's the people who do this, right? Am I correct on that? Uh, yes. Yep, Wizards of the Coast. Centuried Dragon. Dragon. Yep. Uh, so they were, they, this has brought up some old accusations of them using AI art. Some people went through and they were analyzing specifically the Sephiroth photo that they released. And there were things where uh, like parts of the sword don't necessarily connect. Uh, it looks like the blade of the sword is kind of floating away from the, uh, what do you call it? The, the guard. Shaft. Yeah, the shaft, sh sure. Um, but yeah, so they, uh, and then Wizards of the Coast had earlier been accused of using AI art and they said, no, we are not using AI art. And then later on when people went, uh, they went through and analyzed things, they came out a week later and they were like, oh, okay. So actually, yes, there was AI art. Uh, in our promotional material, uh, but we do, ha uh, all of our art is created by humans. That AI is due to, uh, various art suites like Photoshop now implementing AI in their tool sets. And so the AI that is being used is in the tool sets of the art suites, such as Photoshop, not AI generated. So. Who knows? Uh, they're claiming that these are all originally done. They even include, if you go to the website and look, they'll, they'll show you uh, the name of the artists that created all these pieces of art. So uh, accusations, but you know nobody's been able to prove anything. So something worth mentioning, but we'll see. But yeah. Yeah, no, that's going to be the tough stuff about the future, right? Trying to prove since he's AI or not. It's going to get harder. Oh, yes. Very, very hard. And yes, I did play Magic and a green deck and I was scrub at it. Always lost. That's why I stopped. I loved I never played the card game. I think I mentioned this on the show because I went to an old boys school and playing Magic would have been like a social dead sentence would have gotten beaten up and stuff. Um, but I played Magic Arena as a 20 something person um, when it was aligned when they launched like the beta and I was like, oh, cool. Magic is super fun. Um, and then at that time I was playing Hearthstone and I was playing like, I think another card game at the same time. And I just was like, nope, can't play more than one card game. Um, which speaking of Pokemon TCT launches, um, into ease. So that is another card game. I'll have to figure out, do I stop snap or start playing Pokemon or not? We'll have to see. Sorry. Yes. No, no, you're fine. A little uh, bit, so I haven't seen any a bit weird. Oh, Okay. It's very choppy for me. All good that's also right. I'm gonna launch uh Rush Wood or actually last story for the day. So sure. Kriya, all yours. So um I was uh replacing Heath Thermal Drees on my computer on the weekend. I was listening to um, a channel that Adam and I watch, which is Game Ranks' is games coming out in November. And I'm like, oh, this looks interesting, and the art looked great, wonderful as usual, which is the thing that always catches my eye. Um was basically this and i just realized this is totally the wrong notes that i have opened up for the game which is fine um but method it is basically a another long line of farming like some simulated world games um and this sort of like as i was looking at the steam description and watching the trailer and this sort of reminded me of what carl highland did which was sort of step up this level of immersiveness where you're in a game right where um, in Coral Island, which I find 90% of the time where you're running around, you'll never see an event occur more than once. You'll never see someone say the same thing more than once. And I mean, in 60, I'm almost 62 hours in the game and no one has repeated a line of dialogue to me, right? Uh, which is pretty amazing. And and I think this is what Mirthwood is doing. Uh, what Mirthwood is doing is this sort of taking this element, putting it in another hot sauce and saying, Let's simulate everything, every character. Uh, let's give them their own lives and what they're gonna, gonna do for you or 30, 40, 50 hour playthrough of the game. Um, so my thought is, it's just a game but has a really, really cool art style. Um, and you're sort of you're put in this place, you get to do all the things you typically do in, in, in the game. And, and I'm sorry, I'm repeating a lot of the stuff that I said in other games. Um, 
is basically you get to raise crops, you get to go out, explore and try things. Um, one of the cool things if you're looking at the Steam page of the game is that they have this really cool interaction system. Uh, like in Coral Island, in Stardew Valley, in, in Harvest, or what is it called? Story of Seasons on the Switch. Um, basically, it's like, hey, Valog, choose one, two, or three. Um, in this game, they seem to have like a system where it's like uh, chat, influence, um, joke about somebody. You have a bunch of options to talk to somebody. And, and so sort of like categories. And when you click on a category, it's like, okay, oh, man, you're a murmur so fat, she works out the moon, that sort of stuff. But probably not that kind of joke, though. Um, so it, it, it's, it's got a really cool dialogue system. And, and that's one of the things that they highlight. You go onto YouTube, you, you go bombard it, you find the channel, which I think that's the one thing YouTube sort of sucks at. We're kind of lucky with middle-aged gaming. When you group on middle-aged gaming, we're usually number one these days, uh, not like a year ago. Um, but like when you Google Mud with, you're going to see IGN first. You're going to see game breaks and game trailers, right? And you have to go all the way down. But when you go onto their channel, you'll find a bunch of videos. And on those videos, the thing that really sets this game apart from other sort of farming lives and games is this uh, dialogue, interaction, influence system. Like you can sort of say, hey, I heard this guy is cheating on that guy with this guy's wife. Something like that, I don't know. Some really messed up love quadrangle sort of situation. Like, um, there's a lot of cool interactions. Reminds me of a game that Anton talked about at one point. Uh, but um, like the Ring Worlds, um, like um, it sort of takes up the interaction and dialogue system a step up from your typical farming life, some adventure, explore, fighting game. Um, that's something I hope my time at Evershine does, though I know it's not that's not going to happen. It was not on their sort of list of things to do, and people not tend to not like that kind of system, in a sense. But I'm excited for Breath of it. When I have time to play it is another story. This is actually as as much as I'm talking about now. This is probably going to be one of those games that I never play just because I'm playing Coral Island and then like after 60 hours, I was googling stuff yesterday. I'm like, oh my god, I have another 120 hours of gameplay to do. So. Um, that's until the arrest end of the year with one hour a day and how many days left of the year? 60? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't be finishing Car Island until 2025. Um, which is why there's no time for demos, unfortunately, for early anyway. But anyway, yeah, that is Mothwit. Um, it is a game if you have nothing to play or you might need something to add to your Steam lists. Um, my list is 149 games at the moment, my wish list. So um, at some point, I will play some of them. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Perfect. And since you talked about Coral Island, just before we're talking about, you know, the uh, Animal Crossing mobile, which is going down and uh, being revived as the as a pay. So no more macro transaction, right? Now you have to pay for the mobile game. Uh, Animal Crossing, Crossing Pocket Camp. Something. Yes. Pocket Camp, right, exactly. So yes, you can pre-buy uh, for about $10 the game is a yes, game which is I just looked at my phone. It's December, December 3rd. Um, and if you pre-order it, or even if you don't pre-order it, right? Like, well, you have to pre-order it, right? Um, you can still take your original save data from your free-to-play Animal Crossing and it will move to the paid version. So you can continue playing. Um, and I mean, the wonderful thing is like, if you are going to get on the plane like me to South Africa next year and maybe to France this year, um, it works offline, so you can play a little crossing offline on your phone. Which is great. Maybe at some point I should play one on the Switch. And with this, at the end of the show, thank you, Cassiara. Thank you for the microphone. Um, so what you guys are playing this week? So, Adam, you said maybe Project Zomboid for Halloween on Thursday. Uh, Ukraine, you said, of course, Coral Island, and I don't think you have time for much else. And because I'm busy with work these days, I'm just doing a bit of high diver. So that's basically our video game use for activity, at least for the week. Or do you have anything else planned? Oh, uh, the potential Switch 2 announcements, right? This week. Oh, sweet. Yeah, correct. All right. So maybe uh, stay with us next week. And on the weekly, uh, weekly quest 7, if I come correctly, uh, we'll talk about an announcement on Switch 2 where I can already tell you that the Elden Ring is supposed to get out on Switch 2 this uh, late 2025. And it's a news from a few hours ago. 
So thank you for watching us. Again, I keep repeating myself, but please like, subscribe, share, leave a comment. We love when you talk to us. And uh, thank you. And uh, it's a good night if you are like me in Canada. And uh, have a good day if you are like the guy in Taiwan. Bye-bye.